Hi, this video is to help you read and understand Patricia Hill Collins' article, Black Sexual Politics, which is a chapter in the older version of Feminist Frontiers. Because it's in Volume 8 but not Volume 9, I um, offer it as a PDF because I find it a really important and enlightening article that speaks volumes about the intersection of race and gender in the United States. If you look in our Blackboard folder uh, that includes black sexual politics, I have links to information about Jack Johnson, the prize fighter. You may know his story as well as some images and links to the Destiny's Child Survivor video, that album cover, uh, the Josephine Baker story, and some background on Josephine Baker, and also a brief video on Sarah Bartman, also known as Sarji Bartman, the South African women, woman known as the hot and tot Venus, who was made an international sensation and object of infamy in the early 1800s, because of the size of her buttocks. So, black sexual politics starts out talking about Jennifer Lopez, not because Hill Collins wants to criticize Lopez or has a problem with her per se, but rather because the fetishization of Lopez's body and her so-called exotic beauty play into a long history in the Americas of fetishizing, which means to hold as high value an object of desire, but not to respect, particularly um, light-skinned black women or women with a touch of African descent. And as a, a Puerto Rican woman of the Americas, Lopez probably has some black blood, but isn't uh, what we would call a black woman. So the um, she talks about Jennifer Lopez's buttocks. She also talks about the Destiny's Child Survivor CD in 2000 and the ways in which the women were clad in animal-looking clothes and sometimes crawled like tigers on the ground. If you think about... Um, even high fashion photography and videos, black women are more often depicted as tigers or wild animals or these wild exotic creatures than white women are. And Hill Collins wants us to think about the historical reasons for that. And in order for us to have some historical context, she talks about Josephine Baker, who had to dance topless or dance just wearing coconut shells. Um, Baker self-exiled herself to France because of racism in the United States. And her sexuality in particular was fetishized in American culture. Going back to the story of the hot and top Venus, however... This goes back 100 years before Baker and talks about the beginning of this fetishization of the African woman's buttocks. So, um, long story short, when we think about the historical parallels between Josephine Baker and Destiny's Child, or between J-Lo and Sarji Bartman, which will make more sense when you look at some of the secondary materials in today's folder. Uh, Hill Collins talks about what we call as how bl um, blackness becomes within Western social thought, meaning the dominant social thought or the dominant ideology, particularly of an Anglo-American culture in which the political power is primarily, was primarily held by white men, um, she says, this important point on the bottom of page 376, that Baker entertained the French when she moved in exile to France with her openness about her body, an important example of how an imagined, and she means imagined by, in the white imagination, how an imagined, uncivilized, wild sexuality remained associated with blackness within Western social thought and continued as a sign of racial difference. And this applies, according to Hill Collins, still in the 21st century, when we think about Destiny's Child and J-Lo. Now, Hill Collins does acknowledge 
but, um, and this is long before Beyonce became the figure as we know her today, but how even in 2000, Destiny's Child did entertain and titillate and did play into that imagined fantasy of blackness as sexual difference. However, their self-definitions as survivors and independent women express female power and celebration of the body and even the booty. Um, certainly Destiny's Child and Beyonce celebrate the differences that are perceived between black and white women's bodies and really, um, we might say, uphold the beauty of a curvy body. In contrast to that, however, Hill Collins wants us to think about this idea, an historical idea of pure white womanhood and what she calls the politics of respectability. This is on the bottom of page 377 in the article. The politics of respectability are the standards through which white women gained respect and cultural recognition historically in the United States. To a certain extent, I think that these still pertain and apply today. So, this is because historically, according to Patricia Hill Collins, so if we look at the bottom of page 377, Hill Collins talks about how these examples involve women of actual or imputed African descent. She says this is no accident because racial difference assigned to black people has often come in gender-specific forms. In contrast to the 19th century idea of white womanhood, wherein white women stood as symbols of race, as pure, submissive, motherly, domestic, and staying within the private realm, black women were differently valued according to expressions of sexuality. This applied not only in the United States, but to the many European nations that colonized the rest of the world. So, although there was a distinctive path of national identity in different European nations and their colonies, there's one overriding feature, which is the way that they treated women. White women or Portuguese women or Spanish women or French women were upheld with ideas of pure white womanhood, created to defend women of the homeland, and in contrast was a corresponding set of ideas about the women in the colonies that the European nations controlled. Hot-blooded Latinas, exotic Susie Wongs, wanton Jezebels, stoic native squaws, the so-called civilized nation states of Europe required these uncivilized and backward colonies for their national identity to have meaning. And in the process, black women emerged as icons of hypersexuality. Men of African descent, of course, were also seen as hypersexual. And Hill Collins goes on later to talk about the ways that even today on shows like the Maury Povich show, um, black men is the baby daddy. And black men as dogs, black men as these very strident sexual let's say, studs, become part of our, um, our imaginary and popular culture in ways that she sees are somewhat dangerous to black civil rights. In the United States, sexual, um, in the United States more generally, in contrast, sexuality is defined in more repressive terms. So for the dominant culture, Sexuality is more limited. Sexuality is more about respectability. Now, moving ahead here to where she talks about the United States as a sexually repressive society. Sexuality is so synonymous with heterosexuality that schools, churches, and other institutions treat heterosexuality as natural, normal, and inevitable. Studying sexual practices that stray too far from the norms sex outside of marriage or adolescent sexuality or homosexuality and formerly taboo sexual practices as anal and oral sex are only viewed as social problems in United States culture. She links this history of American colonial sexual purity to more recent efforts 
to promote marriage and conservative Christian values. Now, we know that Obama moved $5 million or some large amount of anti-poverty sums to promote marriages. Um, this happened with Ronald Reagan in the 1980s as well. And the underlying tenet about marriage and sexuality in um, in American culture and politics is that all sexual practices should only occur within the confines of heterosexual marriage and that the fundamental purpose of sexuality is for procreation. Therefore, we get a dichotomy or a set of opposites set up here. There's an American ideal of married and pure, respectable sex that is only for procreation and appropriate gender roles of passive and submissive white women versus what popular culture displays to us about extramarital sex and wild, uncivilized, and these are all in scare quotes, sexuality as practiced by black people. And Hill Collins tells us that there is an American fascination with this imagined idea of black sexuality. It goes so far to the idea of the taboo, which was previously, as I just mentioned, previously taboo was anal and um, things such as anal sex. Black sexuality itself becomes a taboo in American culture because it's viewed as so wild. And historically, as she tells us on page 383, Interracial sex was also a taboo because black and white people were viewed as so fundamentally different according to racial stereotypes. The idea of the taboo gets revisited in the conclusion to this article where African-American theorist Cornel West talks about the paradox, or shall we say the irony, of a sexually repressive culture that seems saturated with sexuality, but on the other hand, refuses to offer any sex education or open dialogue concerning human sexuality. To West, to West race matters. The paradox of the sexual politics of race in America is that behind closed doors, the dirty, disgusting, and funky sex associated with black people is often perceived to be more intriguing and interesting, while in public spaces, talk about black sexuality is virtually taboo. So there again, we get this idea of taboo, of being outside of the normal, of being unacceptable and deviant. So hopefully that will help you understand Hill Collins's argument. I just want to flip back to our article about The Bachelor again to make a bit of a link and a connection. In The Bachelor, they promote this marital ideal and fairy tale that true love and wealth and beauty will bring you closer to normalization, the ideal of heterosexuality and wealth and even whiteness. When you think about it, the bachelor is usually white and so is the bachelorette. Uh, they define in the bachelor article normalization, which is the opposite of taboo and the opposite of blackness, the process of constructing, establishing, and reproducing a taken-for-granted, unquestionable, and all-encompassing standard used to measure goodness, desirability, morality, rationality, and superiority. The other interesting term in the Bachelor article is heterogender, which says that there is an asymmetrical stratification, a splitting between the sexes, a privileging of men, and an exploitation of women. Now, when we think about adding race into the equation in Patricia Hill Collins's argument, we could say that racial heterogendering or racial nor um, normalization and taboo or fetishization really makes the problem, I would say, tenfold worse. Hopefully that helps you understand some of these terms and readings. And I will, this is a very long presentation, so I will sign off for now. Have a great day.